In his 2020 State of the Union address, President Donald Trump invoked the American frontier as he closed. The American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk on the face of the earth. Our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canals, raised up the skyscrapers, and ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before. But what happens when a boundless frontier butts up against a border wall? Can you have your rhetorical cake and eat it too? This time, with the wall being such a big piece of the president's re-election push, we'll dig into the past, present, and possible future of America's frontier myth. Progress, growth, strength, courage, containment, and protection of the white race, the frontier is bound up in all of that, as you'll hear from our guest, historian and author, Greg Grandin. The end of the myth this week on The Laura Flanders Show. The show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In Donald Trump's 2020 State of the Union, the word frontier appeared at least four times. But the American frontier isn't so much a place, writes today's guest, as a state of mind, a national myth, a disciplining mechanism. So what is significant about Trump's wall obsession and all his frontier talk? In his new book, The End of the Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America, Greg Grandin chronicles the evolution of the American frontier through expansion, civil war, colonial adventures abroad, and the practice of capitalism at home. It's a timely book, already making waves, here to discuss it. Yale historian Greg Grandin. Welcome back to the program. Glad to have you. It's great to be here, Laura. So I'm sure you tuned into the State of the Union uh, this February. Um, were you surprised, shocked? Is this run of the mill? Does Trump do it differently? Well, he does do it differently. I was a little surprised because this is a, this, he, he, as I said, as a candidate back in four years ago, actually said he didn't believe in an American exceptionalism. He distanced himself. He, you know, he presented himself more as a transactional nationalist. Yeah, you say at the beginning yeah. of your book that he was a break with tradition. Yeah, he, he, he openly said that I don't believe in American exceptionalism. So it is, it is interesting. You know, what's also interesting, I think there's a lot of things that one can say about that speech. Uh, we often don't think of Trump when we think about the frontier, mm -hmm. the West. I mean, he speaks in that thick, Queen's accent, right? <laughs> you know, he, and, he's, and he's all bound up in the history of New York. But two generations back, his grandfather escaped uh, sickly Germany to, to make his way across to the United States. And then, and then across to the West, he went to Seattle, where he was a merchant, and, and uh, up into the Yukon, he followed the gold rush. So he kind of lived the, the frontier thesis or the frontier myth. And he may, uh, he supposed to say that he ran brothels in the Yukon and came back and he used that money to stake real estate in, in Queens, and that's the that's the origins of the Trump family. Mm -hmm. So it's not that unlikely that he would invoke the frontier thesis. But what we're really hearing there is a kind of elegy for white supremacy. I think it's hard. It was it, it came at the end, and it was supposed to cap uh, some speech of, of, of great enormity, but of, of import, but it sounded like more like a requiem. It sounded more like a eulogy. I mean, it didn't, his heart isn't in it, and that's the whole point. Well, let's get to that, because you say at the end of your book that it's really not about building the wall, it's about talking about building the wall. But before we get there, let's go backwards and talk a little bit about the, the function the myth has played yeah. over history. So the, the, the idea of a frontier in, in this book and, and in general is really just a, is indexes expansion. No other country in world history has ever claimed the privilege to expand as the United States has expanded. It was the, uh, the, the idea of expansion was present not just in the conception of, of the American Revolution and the, and, the, and the writing of the Constitution, but, but 
decades, even centuries before, this notion of moving west as the source of natural rights. You know, and that's embedded in, in, in the Constitution, the, the founders of the, of, of the Republic, and I can give examples, we don't have that much time, but Madison and Franklin and Jefferson all understood the ability to move west as, as guaranteeing Republican virtue. It yeah. broke up factions, it, 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 it diluted class warfare, it, it kept labor costs high, all sorts of things expansion was central for, and the reality of expansion matched the myth, matched the theory. So the U.S. did expand. I mean, from the, you know, post from the sort of fleeing British rule point of view, it was a land of freedom. It was an opportunity yeah. to escape. It was a possibility to make something of yourself. It did have an appeal to all yeah, sorts of people. Yeah. It wasn't just a tool of white supremacy, although it was that. Well, it was that. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, no, well, it wasn't, the instrumentalism isn't, isn't so important as, in the sense that it was a tool as the way that an idea of freedom, the way that an idea of freedom was, was created out of the, 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 the right of expansion and, and, um, and, and, um, and moving west, and then there's different iterations of it, and we don't have time to go into the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century. But the fact of the matter is that the U.S. did move west, and 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 that was bound up in 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 white in creating what we now call white supremacy. How so? How did it function? Well, there were Native Americans. I mean, this was <laughs> this was a land possessed by peoples, and those people had to be removed from the land. They and to so, to do that removal, you had to argue we had preeminence as white people. We had yeah, a right. It, we had a natural cer it right. It certainly, it certainly transformed international legal doctrine, the right of discovery and the right of conquest, and Lockean notions of property that only people who settle and add labor, mix their labor with property, have the right to possession, and therefore Native Americans. So there was all sorts of legal justifications mm. for dispossession, but the fact of the matter, there was actual dispossession. Legal, but also cultural. I mean, it's creating a cultural sense of what it is to be an American, yeah. which yeah. is to be a white person. Freedom was defined as freedom from restraint. And, 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 that, and that definition of freedom was predicated on on, on, the, on the subjugation of people of color, stealing Native American land and subjugating African American labor to create wealth. That, 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 that Trump t talked about in his closing remarks. So you come to that question of wealth and you talk about how the function of the frontier was also to be a safety valve to enable people in Washington, for example, to avoid having to address inequality. Just send people somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things British conservatives would look at the United States and they would say the reason why we can't give u universal suffrage here in Great Britain is because we don't have a frontier. The United States can grant universal suffrage to propertyless white illiterate men because they won't stay where they are and organize a Labour Party. They have a frontier, so it'll 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 disperse. Now, whether that actually happened in practice, people thought it happened. It, be it was ideologically important and central to the conception of what made America democratic. And, and that moving west entailed, an entailed, the frontier was actually a border. It entailed an enormous amount of violence. Uh, not one trail of tears, but hundreds, mm -hmm. if not thousands. And there were debates. I mean, talk about some of the debates in those early years around exactly this question. Well, there were debates. There, there were debates. There were some people who thought the United States should stand pat and 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 create a, a, a republic or a commonwealth that uh, that had actual positive content, i.e., what we might now call a social democracy or a social republic, rather than constantly fleeing forward. Mm. But it was always too much, too easy. The, the frontier was just too easy to deflect class conflicts at every at every turning point where the United States might have. You know, I'm talking great abstractions here, yeah. but might have turned and said, "Okay, let's let's confront ourselves, let's face ourselves." It, it was just too easy to turn and and flee forward across the. But frontier. how does that <laughs> jive with? I mean, I think a lot of us in our in our schooling remember the debates about the Constitution and the size of congressional districts, and yeah. you know, you have Jeffersonian democracy being about farmers and people who know each other, fellow feeling. You don't want to get too big because you might not you might lose that. Well, well how did that jive with the expansion? Yeah, there were some debates, but but they 
all, everybody agreed on, uh, agreed on expansion. Jefferson ha m wanted an empire of liberty. He believed his, his republic of agrarian farmers necessitated Could be very expansion, and he presided over the Louisiana Purchase, Madison. I mean, what the genius of American republicanism or U.S. republicanism is that they turned republican theory on its head, where Montesquieu in France, this is really getting a little bit into the weeds, <laughs> uh, thought that you could only have a republic in a small place because if it, the bigger the republic, the more, more personal ambitions would corrode republican virtue. Madison, f in, in Federalist 10, flips that on his head and oh. said, no, you, you, the way that you maintain mm -hmm. Republican virtue is you extend the sphere. And, you, and, and by extending the sphere, you actually dilute the, the, the faction, what he called factionalism, or what we might call populism. And, um, and the other thing that Madison did is that he, um, he, he defined personal ambition not as a, a corroder of virtue or a corrupter of virtue, but as virtue itself, the pursuit of individual interests is the source of Republican freedom. Well, okay, so before we, we move to the present, because we could just keep <laughs> nailing in this, t digging into this, but I do think it's very important what you're leading to, and that's the part of the book where you say our frontier myth also put in place an order of uh, individual enterprise, binding up with nature, coming up with agreements, and then maybe adding some government. Yeah. A, a sense of priorities that is with us even today. Yeah. So let me just say that the frontier, when we talk about the frontier thesis or the frontier myth, we're really talking about Frederick Jackson Turner's in 1893. Um, he, he, he was an historian in, in, in Chicago. He, he, he presented a paper at the World's Fair, the one, the famous one, that the murderer was stalking and stabbing people, or the one that <laughs> Eric Lawson talks about. But he's the one who turned expansion, the expansion west into an ideology. You know, prior to that, there was, there was an acceptance or an understanding that expansion entailed racism, it entailed brutality, it entailed dispossession. What Turner did is that he took all of that and he kind of deracinated the idea of the frontier. Mm -hmm. And he and he took the race part. He out took of the it. race part. He, he he made it more he, he, he celebrated individualism. He thought he, he argued that expansion went forward not through brutal war, like as if it was a you know, the, the latest battle of a thousand year Saxon struggle for the, for freedom, but um, but but as as a, as a result of commerce and technology and law, and and um, and and why this is important is because the U.S. in the 1890s stood at the verge of catapulting itself into the world, yeah. and it couldn't administer the world as if the world was the Louisiana Purchase writ large, as if it was Indian removal writ large, right? So this was so this was the this is how the frontier thesis becomes. A universal deracinated thesis and just to quickly come back to the Trump speech what Trump is doing is that he's rewhitening yeah. the frontier thesis that's why it's important so explain, because he's <laughs> explain that again <laughs> well again so turn it I mean turn, I'm sure you've talked about the borderfication of yeah. American politics and so, I think that's where you're going kind yeah of. that's where I'm going with it so as the US is moving west the Mexican American war is key that's that's when the US makes it to the Pacific it's in the 1840s, that's where it finally gets a southern border. That border more or less remains fixed. But the frontier keeps going, and the, and the idea of the frontier becomes delinked from the idea of the frontier, uh, from the border. It's only in U.S. English does the word frontier have this kind of existential quality. I mean, in cognates and other languages, in Spanish, frontera just means border, mm -hmm. boundary, national, military line, a defensive line. It's only in the United States that the frontier has this idea of a, of, a, of a creation myth where where individualism is nurtured, where property is created, where value is created through creativity, through hard work, through people working the land, um, and where the U.S. and turn, what's important about Turner is that he was, he was, he was a progressive. Mm -hmm. he, he saw the United States as moving, becoming more liberal as it moved out into the world. All right, so, so but what was actually happening at that moment, <laughs> yeah. just because I want people to, like, the reason we're telling this history <laughs> story is because it's relevant to yeah. right now. Um, what was actually happening at that moment was this huge expansion of wealth in a few hands. You had the rubber barons. You could have had, well, you did have demilitarization after the Civil War. You could have been using all those resources to do something like reconstruction, sharing wealth, bringing a society together. Yeah. Instead, we go on this expansionist war, yeah. Mexico and others. Um, and 
become embroiled in this conflict about what is the nature of the state, what is the role of the state, of the government, and that's a conflict that plays out in the yeah, 1930s. Yeah, there's enormous... It feels terribly familiar to this moment yeah, right now. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a plutocracy, there's enormous economic concentration. We should have had a there's, freedom dividend, but only class, Andrew there's Yang is class, talking right, about it. There's class conflict. I mean, at that, at, that, um, at that conference that Turner spoke at, the World's Fair was one large labor action. Right. You know, there, was, there were general strikes. The, the railroad workers had literally shut down the road to the West. They had shut, shut the frontier down while Turner was speaking. So, and then, so, so there was a lot of, there was a lot of, um, so how do you reconcile this, this great wealth? And that's why, and that's the, some, the importance of the frontier thesis. So, but Trump says, Donald Trump, our president says he wants to shut the border. So yeah. isn't that kind of a labor action? Yeah, so, thing? yes, well, Trump, I mean, Trump could talk about the frontier all he wants. The fact of the matter is, the, the book argues, is that we're in a qualitatively new time. But right. he says this is for labor rights. This is to protect the standard of living. This is to protect the American way. Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean. And it works. Way, he got yeah. votes for that last yeah. year. Uh, well, the way that, that, that national chauvinism and uh, national socialism often speak in the language and, the, and, the, and, the, and speak in the name of the worker or the or the or, or the you know or, or the or the working class. I mean, they're really um, you know the, the thing about the frontier thesis is that it marginalized extremism on both sides of the political spectrum, and it it it, it, it the the constant moving out forward allowed the U.S. to constantly defer its extremism, its yeah. fringe, right? And and you know all of the trauma generated by the last war could just be rolled over into the next war. That's finished. That that's we no longer have that option. We have the war. We have the trauma. Yeah, but we don't have the but we don't have the missionary um, messianic justification that can that can that can that can channel ideologically the passions and the furies outward, and that's why that's why we've seen since since 2006 2005 the the the, the, the frenzies the furies. You know, flying around the homeland. So and people have kind of had it with wars on behalf of democracy around the world. The sort of Clintonian special role for the U.S. in whether the world. they had it. Or, I think they have had it. I think I think people are exhausted by an endless war. I think that that's true. So in a way, we're at that. Finally, we're at a end point. Yeah, of I the think south, of the safety valve. Yes, I think that that's the, 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 the structural argument of the book is that to explain the current moment of polarization and extremism and the rise of a of an unhinged nationalist right that that has turned cruelty into a point of pride. I think you have to look at the closing of the frontier the, the, and, and in, in three in three very specific ways. One is war is no longer War is war, and we're at war, and we're always at war, but it's no longer a missionary, it's no longer justified in missionary terms. Two is the collapse of the economic growth model, 2008, 2007, and, and the, the deepening the economy of the, and, yeah, the, the, and the deepening of the inequality, right? There's no more, no, no more can you make the argument that growth will lift all boats because there is no growth. There's just concentrated wealth. And third, more than anything else, is the climate crisis. Mm. You know, there's the, a cap. Yeah, there's the, the politicians can no longer point beyond the frontier and say, there, that's where our problems are. In will the be State solved. of the Union, Trump's saying, we're going to go to this Mars. Yeah. He can say whatever he wants. I mean, he can, you know, but, but, but the if there's no frontier? material con but if there's no material backing that, that will, you know, other presidents, when they invoke the frontier, had the ability to actually expand. So when Reagan, for instance, after the malaise of the 70s came back and and reamped the cold war and restarted the frontier and reclaimed the frontier he was able to you know basically privatize the new deal and and jumpstart mm -hmm. growth and and he was able to push into central america and push into the third world so there was there was a material context for that Re-ideology. So you're saying there isn't a material context for the boldly go Star no. Wars <laughs> reference no. or Trek maybe um, space program no. that Trump is pushing? Well, the space. This is a little. This is my little bugaboo. Is that the space program actually? A lot of people. A lot of people want to like to make fun of Trump for the space program, but his predest. The Pentagon's been pushing for. Oh yeah. You know, so it's it's only it's only. You, 
but um, is but, that, but, but does it function, but, I guess my point, as well, a sort of safety valve? I would valve. say that if you oh, look, really, you can't send to, enough people there. Yeah, I would say that if you listen to the rhetoric, what he's talking about is, is, is space as a giant mm. wall, mm. As, as a border, not as a frontier. I mean, he might use the word frontier, but he talks about, he talks about the m militarization of space. He talks about basically space as if it was a giant wall. The, the <laughs> tagline for our show is people doing things that other people think might be impossible. We try to lift up like positive models. There are some in your book of thinking about frontiers differently. One may be the Bolivarian Republic idea, the Central American, South American notion. Another, perhaps, we've had Roxanne Dombar-Ortiz on this program, the author of the wonderful indigenous history of the United States. The prehistory yeah. to the American colonial story was a sort of federation of Native Americans who traded and related and connected um, long before colonial settlers did it. Name one. Is there a model out there of thinking about working around making real a relationship yeah. across borders uh, in current life? I mean, I think there are... I think there's a lot of models, but there's basically two responses to the idea that the frontier is, to the realization that it can't go on the way it's been going on, that the frontier is closed. One is the barbarism and nationalism and the, and the, and the nationalization of border brutalism that we've seen with Trump, turning the, turning the, what, the militarization of the border, which long predates Trump, but turning it into a, a, a spectacle in mm -hmm. which he organizes his base. And he tells them that, yeah, we can continue going on. All we have to do is build a wall, and then we can burn gas, and we do what we want. We just have to keep them out. I think, I think that's as, I don't, some people present that as a demystification of American ideology. I think it's just a remystification, because you, you can build the wall as high as you want, but things cannot continue to go on the way they are. The other response is a more humane response. It's an idea that we're all in it together, and that we've got to figure out uh, at the U.S. has mm -hmm. one of the things that the frontier and the myth of expansion and the reality of expansion has allowed the U.S. to do is claim a, se a center, a liberal center, as the highest standard of universalism. And it's allowed the U.S. to defer questions that other countries confronted in the past. Mm -hmm. Basically a choice between barbarism on one hand or socialism on the other. And it's no I don't think it's any coincidence that in the last national election, all of a sudden, what was on the table was barbarism in the form of Trump and a socialist challenge to the Democratic Party, a Democratic Socialist challenge. And we're back, we're back, we're, back exactly. we're confronting that choice again. And that is unique for the United States. And, and, and so there's a lot of books about trying to explain polarization, but none of them explain it in terms of the end of expansion, right? The, the, that's the fact that we get that help, and I'm right. so glad we're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we've given Trump and the Trumpers um, their, t their time on this program so far. It is also true, it seems to me, that progressives, liberals, people on the left side of the spectrum have also tended to flee to friendlier climes, have, have avoided addressing the traumas, the dramas where they are by moving to liberal capitals, to, by moving to metropolises. And, I, and I'm thinking as we talk about um, a fantastic project in, in um, Oregon and, and Idaho, the Rural Organizing Project, which is led by LGBT mostly women who say, I want to stay where I live. I want to stay where I was born and work with people here. And they're also the ones that say, I can't not talk to Trump voters because that's who's here. Right. And that seems to be an important lesson for the progressive side of the spectrum, yeah. too. Yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly right. Just being where you are now, right? And that's something that, that the United States, you know, in terms of its long history, has, has, has not done. And in, in you're speaking again in the broadest. Because we have had a tendency to say there are red states and blue states and you can yeah. live a happy life as long sure. as you go to a blue state. Sure. Or and, on the and, and, side and vice versa. And it is true during moments of political reaction, there's a tendency to withdraw and the romant and find, you know, fulfillment in the romantic movement and, you know, and interiority or right. back to the land or, you know, that that's a, that is a long that is a, that I think that's a human impulse. And but in terms of a larger political culture and policy options. I think that we're, we're really confronting a stark kind of choice. Barbarism or socialism? Barbarism or socialism. Is there any history of what 
happens if we choose the barbarism? Well, there's a, the, well, there's there's the history of Nazism, the history of fascism. I think we're living through it. I think we see it in Brazil. We see it in the Philippines. We see it in India. We see it, in, you know, in 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 in, um, in countries in Eastern Europe. We see it in Italy. I mean, I think what I think what I think we're seeing very clearly. We're living through a period of of where people have opted. It's not a choice that's pe that, that we, we face, that a lot of, many, many have opted already for barbarism. And are there examples that you cling to <laughs> of being at the brink, at the border perhaps, of that choice and backing up from it and choosing the society first? Well, or the socialism. hopefully that's socialism where we are in national politics right at the moment, right? I mean, if, if you give people, you, isn't that, that is the premise of the Sanders campaign, that if you, that to, you, you, we have no choice but to speak to the, as you said, to speak to the Trump voters and, and tell them that the, the choices that were presented to them under the old liberal establishment were exhausted and they're not wrong for thinking they were exhausted. But this is how we frame the debate. Greg Grandin's book, The End of the Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America, is just out. Thanks so much for Thanks. coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Pleasure. you. It's wonderful to be here. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show.